This week, we interview David Stuttered, the creator of Burp Suite. In the stories of the week, I'll put my lawyer hat on. We'll talk about Android vulnerabilities that are persisting. Routers are going to get pwned. And talks are going to get pulled from security conferences. Stay tuned for that and a whole lot more coming up. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, where exploits run wild. Packets aren't the only things getting sniffed. Systems aren't the only things getting penetrated. Functions aren't the only things getting wrapped. And bits aren't the only thing getting banged. And those cocktails, they're flowing steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. For more information, visit them on the web at tenable.com. Pony Express. Check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pwn Pad, the Pwn Phone, and the Pwn Pro. For enterprises, there's Pwn Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. Edition of Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. Wait, we missed something. We did. Yeah. What did you miss? Well, they missed the Sands Institute. Did they? They did because well, it's, in the, be in, the it's, next it's in the notes there. And we didn't do the now fire up a packet capture and pour yourself a beer. We didn't. We I totally messed that up. Anyway, yeah. this is episode 437. Mm. And here's your host. <laughs> He's a man who can make a mean drink from bartending for dummies and keep saying, on my mark. But never introduces us to Mark, <laughs> Paul Asadoria. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Oh, Thank sorry, you. I had to. You know, yeah. Well, you know, we're in the, the new studio section here, which is um, sniffing paint fumes. And, and, you know, yeah, maybe that was. It's too many paint fumes this week. That's what I'm blaming <laughs> it on. Damn paint fumes. On the lines via Skype, <laughs> we've got none other than not Kevin. Welcome to the show. Oh, we can't. We can't hear you, Kevin. Why not? Oh, there you go. Now we can hear you. Hey. What's up, dude? How are you? Very well. Thank you for asking. How are you guys doing? Doing fantastic, my friend. Yeah, it was funny. Uh, Kevin, before the show, you noticed the 2600 book that's on the bookcase, yeah. uh, which you, I, you might be able to see in one of the shots, but uh, yeah, you might be able to see it if you zoom in back there. But uh, you said you actually contributed to that book. I wouldn't say I contributed. I, I helped uh, um, organize and pick out some of the articles. Oh, and good. Some, for, for anyone who hasn't actually gotten their hands on that, I, I cannot stress it enough. It is such a fantastic read of, of giving a a great overview of what it was like back from you know computer systems in the 80s all the way up into the, the early 2000s just from letters to the or edit, letters to the editor so it's a really historical read that, that that's that's absolutely awesome excellent um, you can leave us a voicemail to honor our 10 year anniversary or roast us as it were um, you can do that by going to our Google Voice number or dialing even our Google Voice number. That's you don't actually go to a Google Voice number. You, you dial. You could, but that you would could. be weird because then be weird. you show up at the Google headquarters and they're like... Yeah. Um, so the number that we have is... Get your pens and pencils out. Do we still use pencils and paper to take down numbers? Get your phones out and program it right into your phone. <laughs> yes. It's 475-441-4225. Do you know what 4225 spells, Larry? Hack. Hack. That's 475-441-HACK. Call today and we'll listen to your voicemail messages. And Imagine maybe that. play some of them on the show. And maybe play select voicemails. 
will be played on the show. And like I said, you can congratulate us. You can just say hi, or you can give us a little roasting. Mm-hmm. We, I mean, it's we, the, you know yeah, the, we the, fart sound, the fart soundboard is t- totally appropriate. Absolutely, be as creative as possible. Larry's teaching Sans Sec Six Seventeen Wireless Ethical Hacking and Penetration Testing and Defenses at the Pen Test Hack Fest Summit and training in Alexandria, Virginia from November 16th through November 23rd. Be sure to check out Larry Sands' instructor page for all of the upcoming <coughs> cost, all of the upcoming course offerings. Yes. Even. Yep. So I got some coming up next year. And yes. at the Hackfest, they do two days of like conference beforehand. So yeah. all, talks all mm-hmm. day. Um, and I'm speaking, I found out today, twice. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. So I knew oh, I was speaking once. Now I found out I'm speaking twice. Today. That's great. So, so make sure you check that out. All the links to that are in the <coughs> show notes. Excuse me. At wiki.securityweekly.com. Uh, sign the petition, petition for the EFF to stand up for strong security. There's a link in the show notes for that as well. We might, we'll talk a little more about that. Excuse me. In the uh, stories for discussion. However, now... This is kind of weird, but this interview was pre-recorded, so uh, it's weird. We don't usually do this on this show. I do it sometimes on the Cigar Show, but for this one, we pre-recorded an interview uh, with David Stuttered. He is the creator of Burp Sweet Larry. Fucking awesome. Yeah. It was a, a really fun interview, and um, you know, some people due to time zone and scheduling just can't make it yep. on Thursdays. So. And, and he was one of those ones <laughs> that we wanted to, to get. Yeah. So we, we had to make some exceptions. So with no further ado, here is uh, – well, he let me call him Daff. So I got to call him Daff. It was kind of cool. Nice. So here's Daff, uh, creator of Burp Suite, in our feature interview for this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Security Weekly. I'm, of course, Paul Sidorian. I'll be your host for this interview. This is a, a very special interview. We actually, we don't do this very often on Security Weekly, record interviews uh, outside of the normal show. Uh, but it's something we're going to do uh, more of uh, in, in the future. And we're going to start with an uh, interview I'm very excited about. Most of you know our guest today. Okay. If you've ever used the Burp Suite uh, for web application testing or read the Web Application Hackers Handbook, we have David Stuttered on our... Well, I really munge your <laughs> pronunciation of your name, David. <laughs> Welcome to the show. I think it was close enough. Was it, was it close enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. You're close enough. Okay. I'm going to call you a DAF from the from here yeah. forward. Is that is that better? That's great. That's nice and easy. <laughs> Excellent. Well, DAF, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I'm of course a huge fan of the you know the Burp Suite, uh, and I've followed your work for some time. Uh, how did you get your start in information security? Okay, so um, when I was finishing up at uni, I was looking for things to do, and um, I, I actually studied philosophy at uni and um, stayed there for quite a while. I did a few years post grad, did a doctorate, and then I decided I needed to join the real world and get a job. And um, I kind of knew a bit about computers, and it was a hobby, and I used to tinker and program a bit. So I, a lot of people seem to be going into consultancy of one kind or another. And I uh, decided to become an IT consultant and uh, went off to do that. It turned out to be okay. It wasn't quite as exciting as, uh, as I thought. But um, I, I met quite a few people who were doing consultancy but with, um, with a, an IT security uh, angle and met a few who were actually doing um, security uh, penetration testing. Uh, and I thought, this sounds, um, it sounds a lot more interesting. And uh, so got to know them a bit and uh, persuaded one of the guys to... Uh, to uh, take me on a few jobs and uh, and start training me up, and uh, that's what he did. And um, back in the day, then it was it was mostly uh, network infrastructure type testing, um, and the kind of uh, the uh, web application security industry as it is now is really in its infancy and just getting going. And um, I kind of learned learned a lot of the basics of, uh, of network and infrastructure, but was quite excited by the by all this new webby stuff that no one really understood. And uh, so I decided to go down, go down that route myself. Now, David, um, I, I'm curious how your philosophy degree has helped you in information security and hacking. Is that have you applied? Would you, you know some of the things from it's, your philosophy background? Well, I guess the, the the subject matter doesn't doesn't directly carry over, but um, the kind of philosophy I did it was it was quite um, logical, analytical philosophy. Uh, and it, there was an awful lot of 
understanding complex uh, abstract uh, mm -hmm. problems and reasoning mm -hmm. about them and having to explain these quite technical weird problems in a way that somebody else could understand and um, th I suppose those aspects of it have carried over quite a lot because the more you get into security problems, uh, particularly when you write software to, to find to solve security problems, uh, things can get quite complex and, and conceptual and you're constantly uh, back and forth explaining them to other people, to users, to researchers, mm -hmm. uh, to software developers. So I guess, I guess the core skills have carried over. So now at some point you have... Um you probably had a problem, I would guess, that you had to write some software to solve. And is that where Burp Suite uh, came from? Like, were you doing testing and said, well, I really need to write a tool to help me with these web applications? Yeah, uh, pretty much spot on. So I, um, back when I started, uh, web security, as we know it now, just really, you know, the, the, the level of understanding of, of, of the vulnerabilities and the techniques to solve them didn't really exist. People were fe feeling their way. And the, the security tools that existed were, were really quite primitive. So that they were basically a handful of hobby projects people had knocked together, which uh, had a few basic features, were quite mm -hmm. buggy or hard to use. Um, being someone who enjoyed tinkering with code and and, uh, and and writing my own little tools, I I started off writing a bunch of different ones for you know some some of them only lasted a few hours, some lasted a few days, and I'd give up and move on to something else. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, one of them that I started one day is the one that ended up um, surviving, surviving and outliving all the others, and and and, and that was Burp. Mm. So it was it was really driven by a need. It was it was you know I, I guess I was inherently a bit of a lazy tester and I wanted to automate as much of my job as possible. Absolutely. So I just started off looking for opportunities to do that. Uh, in the web world, a lot of tasks, people were reaching for, you know, Perl scripts and shell scripts to do, you know, uh, to send a lot of requests and analyze the responses. And, and I rapidly started to look at ways to make that easier to configure, easier to consume the results. And so the very first tool I started working on was actually Burp Intruder. Uh, to do a lot of heavy weights, kind of manual plus automated tasks. So now, uh, were you were you experimenting with different languages in terms of like were there all the tools you were writing in Java, or did you say, uh, well, I'm going to try Java, and that's where Burp was formed from? It, it was the choice of Java was really um, really an accident. So I I, I was co I did I done bits of coding in C sharp and VB and Java and. C and C++, and it, it was really for, for different purposes, I or even just the mood I was in on the day, uh, I, I would, would, would pick a language to start off in and on, on a particular project. And it, yeah, I ended up working with Java and, and ran with it. It's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not, the, not the perfect language, but it's, um, it, 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 you can do an awful lot with it. And what, what's, what's proved to be quite good is that it's being platform independent. So, um, you know, back, back then, I maybe was using one operating system. You can switch around. A lot of our users are using uh, uh, Windows. A lot of them using Linux, a lot using uh, OS X. So it's nice to have that portability for, a, for a, a desktop language. A lot of us are wondering and have wondered over the years how the name became Burp. <laughs> Yeah, I've been asked that a lot. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a, um, a a really exciting, witty answer. It was it was a silly name on the day for a tool that you know I, I probably you know if it'd been like many of the others I'd written would have lasted a few days and I'd I'd have got rid of. And it was just I you know you, you give everything you make a, a name and I gave it that one and it ended up sticking. Uh, and a few, a few times I've thought you know as as Bert gradually became more popular, maybe now's the time to, to you know to grow up and be sensible and give it a name. And I, I kind of always thought, well, you know, everyone knows the name and knows what it is. And, you know, I still think that. I think, it, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a silly name, but everyone knows it. So I think I'm sticking with it. I was, I was hoping for a – I was drinking a lot of beer and belching while, <laughs> while I was writing it. So yes. that's how it became burp. Uh, no, no, it wasn't anything like that. <laughs> well, that's pretty funny. Um, so now, Burp in its uh, what year, what year did you release the first uh, uh, public version of Burp? So I I, I mean I, I, a while ago I actually dug through a load of old um, security mailing list posts and things to try and to to, to piece together the history because I didn't keep much of a record. I think it was around two thousand and three. I uh, I did the first release of um, of the. The, what became the intruder tool and the and Bert, the core Burt proxy. I, I think I started work on them about a year before, but I, I was really, you know, I, I, I was learning how to program back then, you know, so it, it took me a while to get the first editions out. 
Yeah, because I remember talking about it in some of the early days of our podcast, which started in 2005. So, okay. wow. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's really cool. Um, so uh, you released it initially as an open source uh, project. Is that correct? Uh, no, it, it's actually never been quite open source. It, um, the majority of the tools I released were, were just free. So um, I was... Pro, pro, I mean, well, I wasn't pr protecting my source code as such. I was just wasn't didn't regard myself as any kind of programmer, and like a lot of people, mm. didn't want to share my, my only secrets. So yeah, it, it, it was closed source, but but, but uh, a lot of the versions, a lot of the tools were free. And then I settled on this, you know, kind of free version and a pro version model, uh, really just to you know, back then just to make a bit of money, a bit of pocket money on the side. And now it's your full time job, and you have a company built around it, correct? Yeah, it, yeah, it's been. I mean, I guess it's been quite a long, a long history of transforming from a from a, a hobby project that was done for fun um, mm -hmm. in, into what it is now. So it, it, it was it was very much a slow burn. So I, I worked on it for, for for very many years, you know, purely out of love. It was it was it was fun. I enjoyed the creating of cool new features, and it helped me do my job better. So there was this kind of virtuous circle. I, you know, I could work faster, so I could free up time to work on the product, and and, and it went in this kind of new loop. Um, and then, you know, I was becoming aware this was actually getting getting quite popular, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of people were using the product, and I was getting more and more feature requests, and and gradually realized this, you know, th th this has the potential to be something more than a, a pure sideline that I do outside my day job. And uh, quite a few years ago now, about, uh, I think it's six years ago, I, I finally decided to quit my day job and focus uh, purely, uh, purely on the product. Is it still fun for you today? Uh, very, very much so. So the, the you know the, the transformation really, really did carry on from there. So for a few more years, I, I was you know a, a solo developer working on my own at home, uh, but able to spend all my time on it, which was great. And then I, I kind of had the same feeling that that the fact that it was just me working on this was uh, w w was the bottleneck uh, mm -hmm. in, in the way of achieving everything that I wanted to achieve. So I had so many ideas and, and writing the code was the thing that really slowed me down. And, uh, and, and then, I had, then, then we had the next decision, which is like, do I, do I just keep it for myself and work on my own and it's fun and I can do whatever I want ever? Or do I take the plunge and decided to do that and take on some more developers and, and gradually transform it into a, into, into a, a collaborative uh, uh, effort? So, yeah, we've now got um, 16 people uh, behind that in the company. About half of them are developers. Um, we've got a handful of researchers who do security testing and help us come up with new techniques. Uh, and then the and rest they, are more. They all still work uh, from your house, or do you have office space? Uh, <laughs> no, we, uh, we have a yeah. We've, we've got an office. We're based in the north of England. Yeah, yeah we've got an office nice. that everyone. Has. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been good to see it uh, grow like that. You know, remembering it from very uh, early days uh, where it was just you and, and to grow into a full fledged uh, company now is uh, is yeah. really cool. It, it doesn't come without its uh, uh, headaches and challenges. Certainly, you know, having sixteen people that work for you in a in a company is uh, is challenging. But it's good to hear that you're still having fun with it. So very much so. Um, in your opinion, uh, Devith. Is how has web application security changed in the past? You know, or, you know, f thirteen or fifteen years. Uh, you know, since you've been doing web application security. Okay, so um, from the days I when I start thinking about when I started security testing, um, there, there were some there were some very prominent you know bugs that are still very well understood, like SQL injection that that, that were just very very widespread. So you would find the, these, you know, the, the, these horrendous bugs that would, in, back in those days, very often get you straight to system access on the machine because the day space was running a system and there were all these default add-ons that let you, let you add, uh, escalate what, uh, what you could do. Um, and uh, not, not only were the bugs very prominent, but very widespread, but they were also by and large easy to get to. So I remember some apps where there was even like a search box on the, uh, you know, somewhere on the front page and you just mm -hmm. put a single quote in and you get a, you know, unclosed quotation mark <laughs> error message. Right. So um, it, it's a bit less common to see that these days. So I think one, one of the obvious trends that I, that I you know, 
witnessed over the years is uh, those bugs are still there, but there, there, there are fewer of them, and and they're generally uh, harder to find. So you, you're probably getting less and less, you know, rich error messages on the screen. You, you're getting sort of blind, semi-invisible versions of the bugs, uh, and they they'll be tucked away in in the harder to reach places, or they'll be kind of second order versions of those kind of bugs where you know you've got to got to chain a few requests together uh, in order to trigger them. So it's but by and large a lot of the a lot of those classic bugs that we we had back then are still around. It's maybe just just harder to harder to find them. Do you how do you take feature requests from your user base? Is there an official process, or you kind of just monitor like forums and mailing lists uh, surrounding um, the product? So yeah. We, we, we get lots, lots and lots of really good feature requests. We're getting but di direct email via Twitter. There's um, there's an online forum on our website, um, support center, where people can discuss uh, things and, and raise feature requests. Um, we you know we, we catch up with users at, at, at industry conferences and things and uh, and get get direct direct feedback. So we, we we've never struggled to to, to put together a, a very rich backlog of feature requests. Uh, it would it would be, it would be nice to turn the corner and and and, and deliver more of those and uh, we're going as fast as we can to do that. What have been some of the more popular feature requests over the years? Okay, so. The, the, the ones it tends to be the pattern the, 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 the feature requests that excite me the most and, and as a user I, I would I would like to see happen tend to be the ones that I, that I you know I prioritize and, and, and get delivered and it tends to be the ones that that never much excited me or it, or when I'm using the product I don't really lean on that feature very much that, that have ten, unfortunately I've tended to let drift and it's those ones that become the very the very you know re requested ones because there are so many other people out there who have a diff, slightly different use case so mm. if, if I was going to pick our most our most requested feature right now it's when we do content discovery people want custom word lists to be able to run their own set of file names and directory names through the content discovery function and, uh, and find stuff. Uh, that was a function which I wrote, and that, that feature was always on the on the on the wish list. Unfortunately, never made the cut because I had to finish the the, fe the feature at some point. And uh, and it, it was never a feature that I personally used for, for, for some reason. I think I generally did content discovery in a more manual way using Burp Intruder. And uh, and unfortunately, that was one that, that fell through the cr cracks and probably for about six years has been asked people asking for frequently so sorry guys it, it is it is it is on the list <laughs> and uh, and we we probably will get around to it um we get other feature requests that um as soon as we get them we're really excited about particularly um ideas for enhancing the scanner the way in which we can automate the discovery of vulnerabilities and that from a uh, in terms of our interest in the security domain is the real the real uh, you know uh, stuff that we enjoy doing, and uh, and some of those we we, turn, we do turn around quite quickly. I've always found Burp to be a fantastic manual web application testing tool, um, but of course you also have the automated scanner. Um, mm -hmm. Have you have you looked into like uh, improving that automated scanner, um, and you know bringing more functionality to the automated scanner, or you know, do you tend to focus more on improving some of the, you know, like you said, intruder and repeater and some of the more manual uh, requires a human being to do the testing type tools? Okay, so um, you're right. In terms of the history of the product and where it came from, that, that reflects the fact that I was a hands-on manual tester and, and a lot of the early, early feature set was geared around, around hardcore manual tools. Uh, and a lot of our users are still are still at that end of the spectrum, and we we, we do actively support support them and, and 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 add incremental features to those to those tools. Mm -hmm. We uh, a few years ago, we probably actually about I think it's six or seven years ago now. I added the um, the automated scanner, for, you know, for the first time, and that that is used by people who like manual testing because if you can rely on the scanner to cover off some of the low hanging fruit some of some of the uh, core input based bugs like xss that frees your time up to to engage with the more difficult bugs that require human right. involvement um, and it also opens up the user base to a much wider range of people who are not hardcore testers who don't really understand the nitty gritty of http um, Probably over time, we've we've we have put a, an awful lot of effort into the scan automation, but it's really 
our focus has probably been in the core uh, engine rather than very much in terms of usability features. So compared to some scanners, the burp is still not, it's not a point and click scanner. It's, uh, it, it can automate a lot of work, but you, you really do have to uh, know how to drive it. Um, and prob probably over time, um, we, we, we will try to move in the direction of providing more uh, usability features so that people who, who, who maybe in the past have used a point and click scanner can come to Burp and use it in a similar way, mm -hmm. but still have all of the manual tools under the hood that are available to them if, if they want to use them. Uh, and we will absolutely certainly carry on fully supporting the, um, uh, the people that is our original core user base, the, the, the hands-on testers. So we, we're gradually trying to be trying to be uh, uh, everything for all the people. Yeah, I mean, I love the manual testing aspect of it, and especially when I can use Burp to crawl the website, discover a bunch of stuff, and a lot of times I take that and I'll feed that to another tool because Burp allows me to do the best job to discover everything about the application, and I take that intelligence, and then you can kind of feed that to other to various other tools as well, which is nice. Okay. Um, you can also describe for our listeners the ability to... Um, extend Burp with an, an extension and write some custom uh, code that will uh, take advantage of Burp but allow you to do very specific things. Can you describe that architecture and, and how people would do that? Yeah, so for, for a long time we've had um, we've had the extensibility through uh, through the API and that's that's evolved quite a lot over the years and um, that there are some some basic features that, that a lot of a lot of uh, tools use so you can uh, you can you can use the API to to just drive some basic actions like sending requests to different tools, or you can you know you, you can kick off scanning and crawling, uh, and you can consume the results. But um, for the more ad advanced extensions people are working on, you can really get uh, into the internals, uh, into the internal mechanism of how things like the scanner work. So you can you can create your own insertion points uh, in requests where you want Burp to fire its payloads. Um, or you can write your own uh, completely original scanner checks to to discover vulnerabilities that Burp doesn't natively support. Mm -hmm. And um, f sometimes for, for for people who are who are skilled and good manual testers and can program, sometimes you you will looking at a, a target application that uses uh, some some very unusual feature. So it's it's packing its data into requests in a non-standard way, or it's got a very convoluted session handling mechanism that is difficult to automatically identify and cope with. And the fact that the API lets you get right in the internals means that you can you can lean on Burp's, you know, power of its scanning, you know, of, it, of all its scan checks and an and, and engine, uh, but completely hook it into the to the app in, in a way that uh, that works for the details of that app. So it, it, it's, it's really good. Some, some people write just an extension for, for one job to deal with a particular problem they're in, and then other people make some really, really cool um, general purpose extensions that, uh, that add, add elements to Burp's UI to integrate with other tools or add completely new features. And, um, and we've got a lot of those available uh, as, as plugins that you can just, um, uh, you can just add. One of, the, one of the big plans we've got moving forward is, I mean, at the moment, the API is, is quite good and quite rich, but it's, it's purely uh, in process. So to write an extension, you, you write code and you, you compile it or you, you load it as scripts uh, into Burp and it runs uh, within Burp itself. Mm -hmm. um, what we'd like to do is expose the same API or even a richer API th through, through, a, through external means. So some kind of uh, web-based uh, REST interface where you, you can have your, you know, the, the tool can be completely independent out of process and you, you basically give it a URL at which the Burp API uh, endpoint is listening. And uh, you can then have two different t tools on the same desktop or even on different machines that can then talk to each other. Um, and we've got quite a lot of plans in the pipeline for, for making use of that capability to do, uh, to do a lot more integration with, with other products. Mm. Oh, that's great. Um, I've done a lot of testing of web application scanning tools. I've found that, in my opinion, and based on the you know factual information that I've derived from all of my testing, Burp has the best spider. How did you go about creating the world's best spider for web application testing? Okay, um, to, to be completely honest, I. I I've um, I've myself always always been a bit disappointed in, in, in all. <laughs> 
be able to do this kind of is probably because having having developed it and had lots of test cases that we don't yet um, solve using the, the crawler. We uh, there's an awful lot that we would like to do. Um, so the, the spider the spider's been around in some form right since the early days, and um, it started off when. Uh, the spiders that existed were really just just very basic HTML crawlers that would right. find links and follow. Um, so BERT was actually one of the first tools to to properly handle uh, forms based navigation and, and other things within the app. And, and we tried to make that very configurable so you can give your own uh, default values uh, to use in forms. And and you know over the years we've gradually enhanced it with more and more capabilities. Uh, we've we've certainly got we've got. Some plans moving forward to, to try to make the, the crawler um, uh, more effective than it currently is. So, we would like uh, to uh, automatically deal with stateful apps uh, uh, in a more elegant way. So, apps where you need you need to walk through a few steps um, to get the application to some state where mm. some navigation will occur. Um, we'd like to um, automatically cope with login and session handling mechanisms better. So at the, at the moment, you can do a huge amount with BERT, but it requires some manual setting up. We would like a, more of a wizard-based uh, approach. So you just basically walk walk BERT through a login or point BERT at the login page, and BERT will figure out, you know, in 95% of cases, how the app handles login and session, and and, and BERT will set itself up uh, for you. Um, we can that's also do a bit of that's really difficult, though. I mean, because you essentially need to be a web browser. So, um, are you using something like Phantom JS, or what's the web browser component uh, to Burp, or did you write something on your own? Um, so, at the, at the moment, Burp doesn't use any any third party components in in the crawling. So, mm -hmm. um, a year or, year or two ago, we added. Um, uh, static code analysis uh, of JavaScript, uh, primarily aimed at the scanning uh, engine to enable us to find uh, DOM XSS and other DOM-based issues uh, mm -hmm. a lot better. And um, that is partially in in integrated with the uh, with the way the crawler works. Uh, but that that's a key area where um, we're going to look at, um, well, in general, making the JavaScript analysis uh, richer and support uh, support all the language features that we need to, um, and look at ways that Burp can more reliably uh, itself crawl uh, JavaScript heavy uh, uh, applications. Mm. Yeah, because that that ties into authentication as well. Um, because if you can't you know interpret the JavaScript, you're not going to be able to log in. Um, yeah, absolutely. It always seems like web application scanning is a moving target. I mean, you probably know that better than anyone else, correct? Uh, that's right. I mean, there's um, in various respect, respects. So to do to do crawling accurately, you need to keep up with uh, with modern uh, technologies that are being used in the browser, and and those come and go over time. So a few years ago, Flash was very popular, and they yeah. had to support some flash navigation and understand AMF messages and kind of getting the impression flash is, is going to be behind us soon. And um, then, you know, then everything's HTML5 and, and uh, there's, there's, there's an ongoing, you know, evolution of the technologies used uh, on the client. Uh, but also very much there's 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 a continuous uh, progress on understanding threats that, that exist uh, in terms of vulnerabilities. So um, we, we recently added um, a whole new scanner check in BERP for server side template injection, and that this was this is an issue that's been around for a long time and, and has been fairly poorly understood. And uh, we were able to to uh, automatically find um, uh, this vulnerability in a whole a whole wealth of, of common uh, server side templating engines. So, so there, what, there are, what is there are, what is a server side template injection? Uh, okay, so the, the templating engines are, are used um, to kind of build up um, some parts of a page, some parts of a response in the form of a template, and then embed the changing content that needs to, to be customized for each response uh, are, are incorporated into that template. Um, and like a lot of situations where you've got um, you've got some bits of code that are written by a developer and other bits that are put in uh, at runtime by the user. There's the potential for malicious input to, to break out of a um, of the temp of, of the data context and enter the, the the context of the template, or sometimes to do some kind of uh, inline template uh, instructions within even within the data context. And uh, what we found was um, in, in a lot of these cases, you can actually get to server side code execution just by using APIs or features that are 
part of the templating engine. Uh, and even in some cases, the, these templating engines have sandbox modes that are supposed to insulate you and are explicitly for the purpose of embedding dangerous input. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of those we found as a way to, to break out the sandboxes and, and get code execution. So that, that's an example of where, you know, a few months ago, people didn't, didn't fully understand this uh, issue uh, and it's kind of come along and, and, it, and it's, it's the kind of thing that we, we, we keep up with in terms of what the scanner can do. What can uh, users of Burp Suite do um, at a, you know, a fairly high level to be able to test uh, the mobile APIs, the REST APIs, JSON, XML, RPC-based interfaces that are so, so popular now? You know, like we said, Flash was a thing. Hopefully, it's not going to be a thing anymore, but it, you know, it's being replaced by all of this new technology like HTML5. Um, so how do, we, how do we use Burp? What are some you know, tips you have for people to, to use Burp to do that? Um, so with, uh, with, thing, with things like mobile applications, um, you, you can use um, uh, a tool like Burp to cover off um, a fair bit uh, of the work. Um, and this is an area that we would like to look at and see, see if we can, we can offer more support to people who are testing mobile apps. The, the, the basics of testing um, a mobile app with um, an interception-based tool like Burp is that you need to configure the device to proxy its traffic uh, through your desktop machine that you're running uh, Burp on, uh, and fix up the you know the SSL certificates um, so that so that you so that you break the SSL tunnel. Um, from that point on, um, a lot of a lot of the rest of what you do is 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 broadly you know works in the same way as it as it would for a conventional app. So it depends quite how the how the how the client app is is working. Uh, a lot of apps are really just. Just a wrapper around um, uh, uh, around a browser type experience using yeah. HTML5 within the mobile app itself, and and then you, you, you're 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 quite close to what you the situation you will be in just using a browser. In other cases, it's it's it's, it's a genuine uh, fully fledged um, uh, mobile app, and the, the the workflow typically now for that would be that the user walks through all of the app features in the normal way, sends inputs anywhere they can, and just try to exercise all of the potential attack surface um, through the device, and then Burt will be intercepting and cataloging everything that is seen. And generally, you can then, from that point on, test manually or automatically uh, from, from, the, from the perspective of your desktop. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I read probably uh, several years ago now um, that how you can customize extensions to be able to test these applications. And I think that's something fairly unique uh, to Burp in the market. I think um, uh, some of the other products really kind of focus on helping you with the automated testing. Burp gives you these nice facilities if you have an app, uh, a web application that is offering a custom API. Um, if you have that API documentation or reverse engineer it, you can use Burp to test those uh, APIs, which I think is, is so important because I think so many vulnerabilities today are hiding inside of these applications that have these API interfaces. Yeah, that's right. I mean, in, in principle, you can use a tool like Burp to test um, test, test absolutely anything that that is HTTP HTTPS based. So, you know, back in the day, that meant you know you could you could test SOAP apps uh, yeah. with a with like a SOAP UI client uh, using Burp, um, and then increasingly, you know, people are sending uh, JSON within web requests from the browser and XML mm -hmm. and and uh, all of these other data formats and, and protocols are being layered over HTTP. Just purely used for transport, and uh, a lot of those formats, Burp will natively understand and be able to test. Uh, and if you run into one that um, that isn't supported, then as you say, you can you can write an extension to basically tell Burp where the interesting entry points are within requests, uh, and, uh, and and Burp, Burp should be able to take it from there. So I I, I kind of want to transition a little bit back to some of the business side of it. Um, so when you first came out with a professional uh, edition, did you, and I, forgive me, I don't remember in, in the history of the, the, where the features were when this happened, like did you have a whole set of features in the free and then say, well, we're going to have a professional. Um, did you create new features to offer in the professional or did you kind of at that time split and say, well, I'm going to take some of these features that were free and, and put them only in the pro version? 
So right back in the early days, the, the, the only tool that had that had a paid version really was was the Intruder tool, um, and that that was the one that at the time the, the first few tools were written was was the, the thing that was most unique about Burp because I said a lot of people were using manual scripting to try to do semi-automated jobs, and Intruder did make it very user friendly, very easy, and intuitive to quickly uh, use automation in, in a custom way and, and get the results and that that was the first, that was the only tool originally that had a paid version and it was it was essentially that the paid version went full speed and then there was a free version that was that was just slower to so you could see what it could do um, and it, it was really just a bit of a, a hobby sideline get a bit of pocket money um, at the time at the time I worked on the scanner for the first time um, I could really see this. This hopefully had the potential to be, you know, very powerful and very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was also aware that there were there were some automated point and click scanners around that cost a significant amount of money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I really wonder: uh, uh, are they worth their money? How hard can it be to to, to make something just as good? And um, so from the outset, th that scanning tool was was in the in the pro edition, and really these days probably it's the scanner that is the real the core differentiator. So people who people who don't want to use automation and purely want to work manually can, can probably do everything they want in the free edition of Burp. People who want to lean on automation in Intruder and and in the automated scanner um, uh, probably need the pro version. Uh, but it, we've we've kept the pro version so cheap compared to anything else that it's you know you, for the average. Uh, and you've raised prices a little bit over time, not a, not a considerable amount, correct? No, that's right. It's, I mean, I think the, the current price has been flat for a, a good few years, actually, at a, a $300 uh, mm -hmm. per year. So uh, we, we, we've, we've, never, we've never treated Bert like a cash machine that we, yeah. we want to milk. And, and, and uh, it, it's, great, it's great to have a mass user base because that gives us really good, good quality feedback, good feature requests, and right. keeping the price low helps us achieve that. Have you ever thought about raising the price? Um, it, it, it's pretty unlikely that it's that it'll um, skyrocket. I mean, it's been flat for a good few years. It might be that it's that it'll trickle up um, in, in future, but really, um, um, only by probably a few percent each year or so. I, I would expect. It, it's it's very reasonable, uh, you know, when it's three hundred dollars to justify for you know anyone that's doing any if anyone's doing any work that they're getting paid for in web application testing, it's pretty easy to justify that three hundred dollar cost, which is what we've all very much appreciated about um, the the you know Burp Pro. So, okay, so th 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 there are people who would like to use um, Burp's core engine and technology in um, much more of an enterprise context so there, yeah. there are people who are trying to use the api to scale mm -hmm. burp up which is really currently a desktop tool to be um something um something that is, that is much more able to scan tons of applications on a scheduled basis uh, that's certainly something that we we would we would really like to to offer as a as a as a distinct version of the product so um in, in our longer term roadmap um in the years ahead we will hopefully have uh, have another edition of burp which is not running on your desktop is running on a on a server or a, a, a farm of servers and will let you do a, a, a lot more in terms of automatic scheduled scans mm -hmm. test you know test changes over time hopefully integrate with development systems, so CI pipelines. Um, it's likely that that will cost more than the, uh, the desktop edition, but still it's going to, it'll be, for the kind of people who are using Burp in that use case, it, it'll be pocket money. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be way cheaper than, than some other products who are, who are, who are doing that. So are you talking about, uh, and a lot of um, companies in this space have gone to the cloud-based or software-as-a-service model where I pay you a monthly or yearly fee, I can log in, I can run all my burp scans and, and collect all my results. Is that the model that you, you think you'll adopt? Um, I, I, actually, actually, what we've got in mind more is um, off, offering um, a version of burp that's somebody else can do that with so okay. um, somebody uh, either within their own if they're, if they're a huge organization like a bank with 10,000 apps they, they can deploy this internally and, and scan their systems regularly or if they're a big security consultancy with 200 testers they can have um, you know uh, a, a lot of scanning nodes that, uh, that that they can schedule their their regular work on to, to take the work take the work off the consultants machines um, and also if you're a if you're a service provider and you want to do scan as a service you'll be able to deploy uh, this this version of Burp uh, as as the back end for your service, 
um, it, I suppose it, it's not impossible that we might we might decide to to get into the service space ourselves. In the past, we've decided to to mainly focus on the software development because it's what we're good at and. Trying to scale up a consultancy or a service offering um, runs into into new kinds of pain that we that we currently manage to avoid. Yeah, no, good for you to to you know maintain focus. Um, I have a tougher time with that, <laughs> and Chris is probably really la- laughing out loud. Um, so, uh, do you uh, how involved do you get with uh, other people like? Um, the person who wrote Arachne and, and some of these other tools, do, do you folks like that hang out or? Um... Um, yeah, I, t- I tend to see um, see a few of them at, at, at conferences like Black Hat. So, you know, I know reasonably well, you know, some of the guys behind uh, behind NTO yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the Akinesic scanner. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite good to have, have you know, we have, have really good, good relationships with them. Um, I know reasonably well the guy who leads the, uh, the Zap project who actually doesn't live far away from from me down the road in okay. Stockport yeah, and um cool. and it, yeah, yeah we, we, and we quite we sort of share ideas and we even you know with, with some of the um some of the bigger products we've actually done technical integrations with mm-hmm. uh hp hp web inspect and akinetics so um yeah we, 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 have, we have good relations with all them that's good and of course, every uh, individual or company that I speak with that offers a web application scanning tool has uh, a wonderful relationship with Shai Chen, uh, who makes the WavSEP uh, framework and runs sectoolmarket.com. So I'm assuming you've worked with Shai, who I think is a fantastic guy. Um, yeah. What, what's, yeah that, so what's that experience been like? I'm assuming you've, you guys have talked and you know he's done the testing and things like that. Yeah, he's, he, he he includes Burp in his benchmark, and yeah, we have have some back and forth about uh, which test cases we like and which ones we don't. But mm-hmm. uh, we 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 tend tend not to try to put any any influence on him. Uh, we, we take a look at each year's iteration and, and make sure that that if there's any gaps where where Burp's missing a trick, we uh, we get that fixed quickly. Yeah. Yeah, you'd be hard pressed to influence Shot. He's like the most abstract. Part. I mean, he's a, it's a very fair assessment. So, uh, mm-hmm. and I, I find he's a, he's a great guy. Um, in terms of uh, testing applications, uh, I, you know, I've certainly tried a ton of different applications. Which applications do you recommend? Like, if someone wants to test out Burp and they want to have a web application that has a lot of vulnerabilities and really sink your teeth into something really vulnerable to test out all of the features within um, Burp Suite, which mm-hmm. test applications do you recommend? Um. There's, there's an awful lot to choose from, and, and um, trying out several ones is probably a good idea, to, depending on what um, what kind of features you're looking for, or what kind of bugs. So, there's um, I think OWASP do a broken web apps project, which is a, a ready-made VM distribution that has a whole bunch of, of some some apps that are deliberately written with bugs in, and some that are just um, old versions of of. Uh, of, of of, of open source apps, mm-hmm. so getting an old version of WordPress is is, is a good place to start generally, mm-hmm. um, or even just scouring scouring GitHub GitHub for for redeployable uh, web apps that you can install on, on your even, own. You know, even a new version of WordPress is probably a good option. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I missed that last comment. Oh, Dev, are you there? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. I, I missed your last comment. I think it, it got cut off. I wasn't sure if you said something or if you're just chuckling at my WordPress comment. No, I was just chuckling. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so you said OWASP has um, uh, a, a VM that you can download with some vulnerable on purpose web apps on them. Yes, uh, I'm pretty sure it's 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 someone behind OWASP. Who's, who's, I think that there's certainly a project called the Broken Web App uh, Project, and mm-hmm. we've we we in our own. Um, in our own labs internally, we've got tons and tons of uh, lab target uh, apps and code that we, you know, a lot of it we've written ourselves yeah. to to pull that through spaces, and we've got that um, that distribution that running as well. So it, it just means that if somebody's written a new scan check for some for some obscure version of SQL injection, then we we've got lots of rich targets we can we can try it out on to make sure it's not doing anything mm-hmm. uh, inappropriate. We talked a little bit about your your roadmap for for Burp. Um, what, what's coming out in the next version? Like, what's the next version going to be uh, numbered, and what's the uh, some of the features you may want to uh, tell our listeners about that will be in the next version of Burp? Okay, sure. Um, 
For the next few um, few versions, we're probably still talking uh, some you know increments to the minor version number with with a few incremental features. So, in, in the near term, we've been doing a lot of work based on the Burp Collaborator um, uh, feature that we added this year, and that's going to be um, very focused on finding um, some familiar bugs in some completely novel ways. So. We've we've got working the the, the use of the collaborator to find uh, deferred uh, asynchronous vulnerabilities, so things like second order SQL injection or OS command injection that runs in an overnight batch run completely uh, asynchronously from your interaction with the app. Uh, we've got that pretty much working. We're just uh, polishing off a few loose ends and then making sorry, sure. Well, well, could you describe that again? Sorry. Yeah. So, um, so the, earlier this year, we uh, we added a, a component in the scan engine called Burp Collaborator, and this is actually something it, it, it sits outside of Burp, and and, and we, we deployed an instance on the public web mm -hmm. that, that people use, and people can deploy their own. And um, the idea is that Burp still interacts directly just with the target that you're testing, but a lot of the payloads that Burp sends are designed to trigger. Uh, an interaction of some kind between the target and the collaborator. So, um, in the sim in the simplest case, say uh, OS command injection, we might use uh, some syntax to to try to get our command injected, and then we can do an NS lookup uh, with a domain name. Mm -hmm. And if the command executes, uh, that will cause a DNS request to come from the from the target server to the Burp collaborator server. Uh, and um, each each collaborator payload we send has got a very long, complex, random, unpredictable uh, prefix as the subdomain, and that enables Burp to poll the collaborator server and ask, did it receive any interactions for, that originated from this scan? Um, and what that means, we might have a bug like OS command injection that might be totally blind, uh, so that completely invisible. There are no uh, no errors that come back, no evidence in the response. We can't even measure a, a, a time delay, uh, but we can detect that the, the command was executed through the through the DNS lookup. Right. So and it might be a day later, two days later, a week later. I've seen some technology released recently that is doing this with web applications. Basically, I'm putting a payload in there. I don't know when it's going to execute. There are maybe mm -hmm. several conditions that need to happen, but you need to have a listener to say, oh, you know, a couple of days later, someone actually triggered this payload, um, which I think yes. is really cool. Yeah, so th 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 that's exactly what, um, what we're working on in terms of detecting uh, deferred interactions that happen much later than the scan. And hopefully within even a few weeks, we'll be releasing um, quite a lot of new capabilities um, in that direction. Uh, in terms of the next uh, next major release um, for for for, for Burp Suite Pro, uh, some of the features we're working on um, are the ability to use um, a new project file format to save all your data. So when you when you start work on Burp, you'll select a project file, and all of Burp's data will actually uh, be saved incrementally in real time uh, as you work. Uh, if you just if you quit Burp without saving, if you just pull the plug on your machine or Burp crashes and exits abnormally, everything you've done is preserved and you fire up Burp, point it at that, at that file, and that file is, is essentially its memory for this project and, and everything will come back. Um, that's going to replace the existing feature where people have to save a, what we call a state file and reload it and that's, that can take a while and it's a bit of a brittle process that, that, can, that can sometimes fail. Um, so that should be a major step forward for a lot of uh, desktop users, and it and it'll it'll let Burps the amount of work Burp can do it'll let it scale up to a much bigger extent because uh, we'll be using far less conventional memory because all of the data is living off off memory on 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 disk uh, while while this while it's happening. So we should have that um, uh, that feature later this year. Excellent. Well, um, now it's time to play five questions with Security Weekly. Are okay. you ready for five questions? Okay, I'll hear them. I don't know if I can answer them. Okay. Uh, three words to describe yourself. Okay. Um, uh, focused, hardworking, um, generous. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Um, poison of some kind. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Mm, 
all the ways that I screwed up. <laughs> In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I don't even know the name of the, the game Ask Grabby Grabby. Is most that, most people it, don't. It's popular in right. other parts of Europe. Okay. I'll go first. Sounds pretty fun. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. <laughs> um, Elon Musk and Marilyn Monroe. There you go. Uh, David Stuttered, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it, was, it was so awesome to, uh, to get a chance to sit down and, and talk with you. Um, you know, um, all of us here on Security Weekly are huge fans uh, of your product. So uh, keep up the great work, and we look forward to, uh, to more versions of, uh, of Burp Suite. So. Oh, yeah. we forgot to talk about your book. Did you want to just talk really quick about uh, your, your books that you've written? What's the most recent one? Uh, um, well, pretty much the, the, the main the main main book I wrote was um, with with my colleague Marcus Pinto was uh, the Web App Hackers Handbook. Mm -hmm. So that was actually written about seven or eight years ago, the first edition, and then we did a second edition uh, three three or four years after that. Um, that was a whole lot of work, a lot more than I thought, and oh, yeah. a lot of people asked to do a third edition. And, and it, yeah, it's possible we might, but. Um, we tried to write the book in a way that most of the concepts were pretty much timeless and that some of the technology detail might, might need to be um, up updated slightly. But um, people who are learning web AppSec, it's, it's still, a, still a pretty useful resource for them. Excellent. Excellent. Well, again, David, thank you very much for appearing on Security yeah. Weekly. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Uh, that was our interview with, of course, David Stoddard. Uh, Daff. Weird. Daff. 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 As he actually let me call him in the interview, which was... Which I, was I wasn't there, flattering. so I don't get to call him that, so you it's do. It's flattering. Uh, so we're going to take a short break, come back and talk about the stories for this week, so stay tuned. Don't go anywhere.